I think adversity, when it presents itself, is a great opportunity to create culture. As a young entrepreneur in India, Likita Madhukuri has experienced her fair share of adversity, but nothing could have prepared her for the challenges that 2020 would bring. You're always selling your business, but for the first time I had to sell the business and the vision to my people. And I had to, you know, make them believe that we can do this and that we will emerge stronger. The severe health and economic crisis of the global coronavirus pandemic has resulted in the leadership challenge of a generation. And that's certainly true in the field of agribusiness with complicated and far-flung supply chains. And it forced CEOs like Lakitha to take decisive action to keep their companies afloat. Navigating this roadmap while designing it is no easy task. But it's right there, in the eye of a storm, that the true metal of a leader is revealed. I'm Darius Teeter, and this is Grit and Growth with Stanford Graduate School of Business, the show where Africa and South Asia's intrepid entrepreneurs share their trials and triumphs with insights from Stanford faculty and global experts on how to tackle challenges and grow your business. Today, we meet Likita Madukuri, CEO and co-founder of Terra Greens, to hear her incredible story of adaptive leadership, company culture, and bold moves during crisis. From an aerial view, the city of Hyderabad is enormous. It's a sprawling metropolis where historic architecture sits alongside a glittering business district, and it's home to a population of almost 10 million. Companies from diverse sectors have flocked here, from research and manufacturing to pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, everyone drawn to this ever-expanding skyline. It's busy, it's hot, it's teeming with innovation, but if you track your eye just outside the city limits, across a broad six-lane highway, the picture changes entirely. What you see is a dense patchwork of fields, rice, corn, sesame, cotton, groundnut, soybeans, and many other crops. In this semi-arid climate, agriculture is booming, and it's here that Terra Green's organic farming takes root. The story of Terra Green's is a story of two women, Lakitha and her mother. I never really wanted to be an entrepreneur. My mom was uh, uh, farming in our family lands and it was her hobby to grow uh, fresh produce. And she was getting all this produce back home and she was forcing us to eat all of it. We didn't want to eat everything that she was growing. So we drove down to like a supermarket next to our house and asked, would you stock organic produce? And he said yes. And that's how Terra Greens came about to be. We started like a small subscription based uh, fruits and vegetable delivery service in Hyderabad. But we uh, built the business along. Uh, and uh, then today we work with about 12,000 farmers across five states. I love that it all started with you trying to get rid of some of the vegetables that your mom was putting on your plate. I think my, my kids would do exactly the same if they could figure <laughs> out a way to pull it off. Tell me a little bit more. So is there a strong demand for organic greens in India? Is that a growing trend? The market for it has been growing steadily. In the organic sphere and in India, our challenge comes forward in terms of creating awareness as well. So we have to constantly educate our customer and we have to constantly engage in conversation with our customer. We have to tell them what organic agriculture is, how is it better, and make sure that they are on the same page and also see value because organic food in general is more expensive. So if they do not see value in it for their health or for the health of the planet, then uh, we lose the connect with our customer. What we notice is that for organic grains, there is demand, but also we need to consistently build supply. So as an organic food company, our challenges don't only lie on the demand front, because back in 2012, 13, people would come and ask us, what does organic mean? So we had to go back and build the supply chain. Interesting. You know, I, when I think about uh, farm to fork supply chain in the United States, it's broken up into a whole ton of intermediate players along the way. You don't really think of anybody actually owning the whole supply chain or controlling the whole supply chain. But how does it look in, in your specific case? We built everything. 
So when we started, uh, we didn't have anybody doing uh, anything. So we didn't have warehouses, we didn't have processing units which were uh, processing organic food or we didn't have farmers. Everything was so fragmented that if we wanted to have a sustainable brand, it became inevitable for us to dip into the supply chain. It wasn't uh, something that we wanted to do. So I think where we stand, I have customers who come to me for uh, private labeling. I have customers who come to me for bulk produce. I have customers who come to me as retailers or even direct customers. So we have revenue streams uh, that we've built throughout the supply chain and that's happened over time and with scale. Uh, we didn't have that when we started off, uh, but today I think we do engage with customers along the way. In a few short years, Terra Greens has experienced incredible growth, and that's no mean feat for a first-generation business owner. So I wanted to find out a little context about what it means to be a young entrepreneur in India today. I called up someone with deep experience of entrepreneurship and doing business in India. In most cultures out there, failure is not tolerated. Failure is ridiculed, sometimes even punished. That's Baba Shiv, professor of marketing at Stanford Graduate School of Business and an expert in neuroeconomics, the study of decision-making that combines economics, psychology, and neuroscience. In 2007, Baba was invited by the Department of Science and Technology in India to speak at leading Indian universities about how to foster entrepreneurship. In his conversations with the students, Baba started with a simple premise and a question, and the responses he got were telling. You can either be an innovator or you can be an entrepreneur. And there's a big difference out there. You can innovate stuff and then sell off the IP to someone else. Entrepreneur requires you actually have to run a company. And I asked every one of these students that I met up, would you like to be an entrepreneur? And invariably, this is 2007 time period, they said no. Students said no for many reasons, but Baba noticed one common factor. In India, like in many cultures around the world, career decisions aren't just made by the individual the whole family gets to have a say. If I'm this young person going to my parents and saying, I have a job offer from the Tatas, but I want to go into entrepreneurship, what do you think the parents are going to say? They're going to say, you are stupid. <laughs> this is how I brought you up. So it sounds like as recently as 2007, young entrepreneurs in India faced this uphill battle, which only makes Lakita's story that much more impressive. India's attitudes to entrepreneurship are changing, and we'll hear more about that later, but right now I want to take you to a very specific moment. It's March 24th, 2020, the evening that the Indian government swiftly placed the country into a national lockdown. I think uh, we all knew that it was coming. I was prepared mentally to have conversation with my people, but I didn't think that a lockdown would come about or that it would come about so suddenly. My first reaction, I think, was to take a call whether to shut the factory or not, because we came under the essential space. Uh, we could function, but my biggest challenge was to get people to come to work. And whether I should, because we don't know if the virus would come along with the people who would come to work. Uh, but I took a call, I think it was a hard call, but I took a call not to shut the unit. Um, and um, on Monday, uh, March 25th is when I uh, went to the factory. Um, it was hard because we had police everywhere, we had people and uh, there were villages that uh, come on the way to the factory and they didn't allow our cars to go. So I had like a bunch of people chase my car. In this country, when we went into lockdown, it was actually Santa Clara County in California that was the first place to lock down in the entire nation. So that's where I live. And from an emotional point of view, it was almost a sense of panic because lockdown made, made us all think, wow, this must be much worse than we thought. So is that what was going on in the villages on the way to your factory, this sort of sense of fear? There weren't any positive cases in the villages yet. So what they felt that anybody coming in from the city or passing through would get the virus along. So they didn't want any traffic from the cities to come to the villages. We had people uh, come in and chase my car. I had a bunch of 
people who weren't police, uh, who like threatened to uh, break the glass of my car and stuff like that because I was trying to go to um, my factory. Despite this dangerous situation, Lakita made that first really bold move as a manager by deciding to keep the factory open. I think the first day, six uh, daily wage workers turned up and I asked them, I said, uh, do you want me to shut the factory? Are you scared? Do you want this to happen? And they said, no, we will come to work. Just make sure that we come safely to work and we will come. And I felt like when they showed so much confidence in me that I should show confidence and stand up at that time. With this vote of confidence from her employees, Likita began to tackle a seemingly endless list of challenges for her business continuity. And the issues were around things like staff health and safety, supply chain logistics, ID cards, even just getting to the factory. Suddenly, everything that was easy now became infinitely more complex. The first few weeks were so much panic. We had issues wherein our uh, transportation that we provide for our labor was stopped. And uh, we had to actually create another detour. So we told our uh, workers to wait on the main road and we would run our uh, auto from different points so that we could pick up each one of them along the way, not the main road so that the cops would not stop them because even the cops aren't, they aren't educated. They do not know what essential commodities are. And we also have a smaller wing of the company where we do home delivery. Uh, we had our uh, home delivery staff being harassed by the police. Actually, few of them even got beaten by the police for being on the road. And we had to give them so much more protection and uh, we had to give them letters and the ID cards, the T-shirts, everything so that, you know, people know that we are a legitimate company and we people aren't just on the streets for no reason. There's so much to unpack there. The, the amount of sort of creativity and quick judgment that you had to practice. I mean, the decision to keep the factory open was quite bold, I think. And so I'm interested in the steps you took as a leader to make that a success. I think the confidence came from the team because they said that they would come. And uh, then we said that, OK, whatever happens, even if one person turns up, the factory will run. So uh, we have uh, three, four revenue streams. So we do pack for other uh, uh, companies as well. So we took a call to prioritize them. So based on the labor that turned up for the day, we would plan production. And uh, based on the kind of work that could be done, we did. In hindsight, it feels like such an adventure uh, because we had so many people call us and ask us, are you functional? Can we buy grocery? Can we buy vegetables? And we had to uh, service them. And uh, there were so many of them who came back and said, like, thank you for not shutting down and for not, uh, you know, giving up. And I am eternally grateful to the people, uh, especially the staff that turned up uh, because they did it even if they were scared. All of them were scared, all of them had challenges and all of them had pressure from home because a lot of their families were like, why are you doing this? There's no reason for you to do this. You can just sit at home and, the, and I wouldn't fire anyone. I, I would still like take it. I would be like, okay, fine. You know, you're working from home and uh, we understand. But none of them did that and all of them turned up and I think I'm so grateful for everyone. But it took conversation, Darius, I think uh, a lot of conversation. Lakita's communication strategy is actually a key piece of this story. But before we get to that, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the mindset of a leader during a crisis. It's evident that Lakita showed real clarity of thought right from the get-go. But what exactly is going on when we have to make these difficult, astute decisions? So I asked Professor Babashiv for his thoughts. At the end of the day, most human decisions and most human behaviors are grounded in emotion. It is not the rational brain. The way the emotional brain is geared to behave at any given point in time will depend upon the mindset that prevails at that point in time. 
Is it a type one mindset or is it a type two mindset? So these are terms that are borrowed from statistics. What is a type one error in statistics? It's a fear of making a mistake. It's a fear of failure. The type two mindset on the hand is not a fear of failure. It's a fear of missing out on opportunities. At the end of the day, it's really not a fear. It is a desire for new opportunities. And there's a lot of research backing this up that something like 90 to 95% of human decisions and behaviors are shaped non-consciously by emotional brain systems. What the rational brain is good at is not at being rational. What the rational brain is good at is simply rationalizing what the emotional brain has already decided to do. That's fascinating. So from what Baba Shiv is saying, it's the emotional brain that steers those mission critical decisions. Lakita made important calls quickly because the rational and emotional sides of her brain were well aligned. And as we'll learn, she was quick to identify new opportunities also in the midst of this crisis. The emotional side comes into play again to address the challenges of staff morale and communications. And she had to establish new ways of working in the strange confines of the home office. I had this uh, thing that I started um, where I would check in with everybody in the morning and check in with them again in the evening. Because uh, working from home is so new to all of us. How do we inculcate accountability? Uh, how do I get them to turn up in front of their laptops at 9 a.m.? I cannot control that. I would get up, I would wear my work clothes um, and look like I'm going to office and sit in front of the computer, switch on my camera, make sure everybody switches on their camera and they look like they're coming to work. So I would check in with them at 9 a.m. Everyone, I would just say, good morning, how are you doing? What's your task for the day? Run me through this. And then in the evening around 4.35, I would check in with them again. So every single day for almost two and a half months, I checked in with every person. It was exhausting for me, but I think uh, I got to know my team so much better because I would never spend that kind of face time with them. So you introduced a lot of accountability processes. I'm curious to know how they responded to that, your management team. And, and I'm also curious to know uh, this newfound approach to doing a lot more communication uh, with the factory floor. Uh, are you still doing that now that the lockdown is over, you know, so many months later? Um, so to answer the first part of your question, they hated it. They absolutely hated it. Um, they were just wondering why I'm behind them and why I'm like, you know, being so involved in their work. And um, they found it really uncomfortable uh, in the beginning. Uh, but now uh, they send in their task sheet in the morning and in the evening without me having to ask. Um, I think uh, it set a culture even for them to plan their day and to end it. And uh, I think they appreciate it now, uh, but they, most of them actually, have implemented the daily task sheet and the daily check-in in their own teams. So the second layer, they found value in what I have done. So I think like it, it was positive and we still do it. Uh, we have like an extremely uh, well-defined structure, which we didn't have before. And the communication also uh, is very free now because what happens when you're on a video call, I'm sure most of us have also realized this, is that you can't be distracted. We did uh, put in a culture of gratitude and also that, that you know, we need to turn up for each other not only for ourselves, but for everybody else who is going through this panic situation where they're not getting their groceries on time or they don't know what's going to happen uh, in the future. When uh, Even when I spoke to the daily wage workers and these are people who are uneducated, they're, they're not, you know, they do not understand the bigger picture. They understand that they need to survive through this. I spoke to them and I said that, uh, you know, we need to do this because if we do not give people food, what will they have? Uh, three months down the line, the supply chains will be broken and there won't be food in the market. And all of them understood it. 
You know, the undercurrent of what you're saying is that you had to create a corporate culture on the fly. And part of that corporate culture was gratitude and mission. Uh, the mission of getting healthy food to people when, who are locked down and the gratitude of being able to serve that mission despite the whole economy coming grinding to a halt. Is, is that a fair characterization that you were creating a, a corporate culture on the fly? That's a really nice way of putting it because, uh, yes, that's what we did. And um, like you very rightly said, uh, driving the mission for a small company to the ground level is really hard, especially when you want to create a culture and something that uh, you want to imbibe in people. And uh, I think adversity, when it presents itself, is a great opportunity to create culture. And um, it did change me, I think, as a leader in terms of how I present myself uh, because I had to talk so much more to my team. I usually, uh, you know, as somebody who's building a business, you speak to your clients, you speak to other people, you're always selling your business. But for the first time, I had to sell the business and the vision to my people. And I had to, you know, make them believe that we can do this and that we will emerge stronger. And I had to tell them that we have to be so grateful to be in a space which is affected positively by the pandemic. Nikita inherently understood that the strength of the company lies in every link of the chain. And there is an important lesson here. The degree to which team members are able to collaborate through a difficult time can make or break a company. And as Bhava Shiv explains, the onus is on the leader to foster that environment. If everyone is stressed, generally what tends to happen is people will go into their own shell because it's a survival mode. I have to survive first before I start helping others and start collaborating with others. The leader's job is to have the internal team members get out of the state of stress, knowing that our survival is going to come from teamwork. The leader's job is to tell the, the staff out there that it is not about losing, it's not about winning out there, but let us feel proud. And let us feel proud in such a way that when we emerge from the crisis, we would have emerged much stronger, not the company, not the leader, but all of us collectively have emerged from it feeling much stronger. Terra Greens did emerge stronger, and that's partly due to this culture of gratitude. The Kita's ethos was more than just words on a list of company values. It was a core pillar, and it was embodied and expressed in unison. After this initial rush to put systems in place, the ensuing months brought a host of new and difficult choices. Pre-pandemic, Terra Greens had ambitions to expand their global presence. In fact, Lakita had just returned from a business trip in Dubai when the lockdown hit. With demand in the domestic market unexpectedly booming, Lakita had to pivot once more to confront the challenges in her supply chain. We were forced to act quickly. I wasn't ready to uh, start business development at the pace that I'm doing today. I, I didn't have the marketing collateral. I still don't have like uh, things in place to scale as quickly because uh, the market opportunity presented itself. We didn't have a problem when it came to demand. In fact, our demand rose. Uh, we just had to look inward and build supply. And we were dependent on so many others for our supply chain. And the breakdown happened in terms of logistics. The breakdown happened in terms of manpower. Like, if, for example, if I had a machine breakdown in my factory, I cannot get a technician to fix it. Uh, we couldn't, like, get spare parts. Our sieves broke and I didn't have sieves for two months. That would never happen in a normal scenario. Uh, so I guess we realize like how much we depend on other industries. And um, the decisions I had to make was to develop direct supply chain. So if a truck left our unit, then it had to reach my customer uh, directly. We couldn't have people stock our products because we were uh, wasting our stock there and it was getting stuck. You know, I think for a lot of companies at the beginning of the pandemic, they had a cash crunch. Cash is king in a business like yours. So how did you conserve cash? How did you deal with uh, buyers? So I think um, this pandemic came like a blessing in disguise because I stopped supplying to 
my customers who were bad payers. Uh, so we said like, see, we have limited stock. I can only produce this much and we are going to supply to people who pay us. So one thing what happened is that we identified our good customers because it was the need of the hour. The second thing that happened was the people who weren't paying us or who didn't want our stock or if their businesses weren't doing well, we finally identified them and said we will not supply to you. So I think on the receivables front, uh, COVID was like my angel, my blessing in disguise because we finally cleaned out and prioritized our customers and we prioritized the profit centers, the loss centers. And also it helped us understand that um, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of time and effort because I had to work with 30% of my labor force. So if I had to put my 30% to the best possible use, I had to say that, okay, I'm going to spend this much time and this much money and labor on this account. So it better like fetch me this much. Um, so we started even looking at time and labor as something like an input into the business apart from just cost of goods. So as a business model, we really became lean and uh, we tried to make the best of it. Uh, and as a small business, we always try to see like, okay, any customer is a customer. But when we started working with constraint, we said no to a lot of people. And I think good businesses do well because you have the power to say no more than, the, uh, more than when you say yes all the time. As the old adage goes, you never want to miss the opportunity in a crisis. And it's in this very ability to see that opportunity, to be innovative, to react, to pivot, that really defines the success of a business during unprecedented adversity. Keep in mind that it is Charles Darwin who said that it is not the strongest of the species that survives, not even the most intelligent. The one that is going to survive is the one that is most adaptable to change. So don't assume that your strength before the crisis is going to remain the same going forward because there are other players out there who are probably being doing the right kind of things in terms of being innovative, adaptive, et cetera, who are going to be much, much stronger. So the survival of the company in the long haul never ever comes from sticking to the status quo. It always will come from responding to change that is happening. And that is where the leader needs to have an innovation mindset. And the organization as a culture needs to have an innovation mindset. The story that Lakita has shared with us, I think well demonstrates this innovation mindset. Tara Green's weathered the storm thanks to Lakita's adaptability and to her true grit as a leader. And it's clear that there's bigger and brighter things on the horizon for her company. You know, I had asked you earlier, what did you have to give up as a result of the pandemic? And I, I think you mentioned that you wanted to start your own retail business. And I wanted to just hear a little bit more about what the plans are for that. But also, I want to hear about, you know, your ability to raise capital for your business plans now and in the future and, and what that looks like for you. So uh, it's been great. But like I said, we were in a slow and steady mode. We weren't planning to expand as quickly as we are expected to now. We didn't plan for competition because now we see so many people entering the essential goods space and uh, we see so many um, like small and medium business, even larger businesses looking at agribusiness like an opportunity which they never did before. So um, the landscape changed. I think we look at more competition. Uh, at the same time, we look at a lot more opportunity and we have uh, realized that there is a need for speed here. So when uh, we started looking at things objectively and we said, you know what, we're going to expand, money will come. And I just told my team, let's go and do this. I will find the money. Finding the money is my job. Getting things done is your job. Do it and I'll find the money. And I have been able to till now. The um, investor landscape for this space is extremely positive right now. But when that's the case, we also need to be really careful in terms of the quality of capital that we get into our business. Because at the end of the day, the most valuable thing out there is my business. One thing, of course, is to be extremely open to change, whether it's with the team 
or with my business plan we're constantly evolving and that's been decent for us right now in terms of capital yes we are looking for investment uh, because the opportunity has presented itself and we do need to scale at this point it's things are changing i think every day we see so much change i have not experienced this kind of change that we have in the last 6 months i think in in my entire lifetime we're experiencing this here at seed as well in this pandemic crisis with change happening so fast we are we need to be willing to reinvent our strategy almost monthly and so i think that's a a, a real leadership challenge is just to figure out how to constantly review and be agile and be responsive and adaptive I want to shift gears a little bit here and kind of ask a bit more kind of metaphysical questions if if you don't mind. What does it mean to be a woman entrepreneur in India? Is that is it a different experience from being a man a male entrepreneur in India? It is different. I mean, it's obvious, right? It is going to be different because women are different and uh, our approaches are different and especially something like Terra Greens which was started by two women founders with without any male co-founder. are extremely different uh, we're not a family business uh, we're a startup in the agri commodity space uh, so when we did start out we were very naive and uh, the major challenge that i faced uh, because i was uh, 22 when i started terra greens and uh, I, my mother was my co-founder she was a housewife for 45 years before she started terra greens with me Uh, so we were basically first generation entrepreneurs without any prior experience in business. We just wanted to do something, and we just did it. When I spoke with Lakita, her passion was unmistakable. It was incredible to hear how her and her mother thrived in the face of adversity, and it reminded me of something Baba Shiv had mentioned before: the face of entrepreneurship in India is changing. We are beginning to see the change. I mean, from 2007 to 2017, there was a massive change in what I was observing on the ground in India. Now, young kids in the top 10 percent of their class, they don't want to go and work for a large corporation. They want to work in a startup. Why? Because that taboo has disappeared. That's because now there are role models. Companies like Flipkart in India, etc., who become very successful. Now the parents are saying. Yeah, you have an offer from the Tatas, but I don't want you to go and work in the Tatas out there. That is for the previous generation. I would rather you go and start a company and make it into the next Flipkart of the world. It's important to realize how empowering it can be for young entrepreneurs to have someone to look up to. Positive role models have this ability to really transform the business landscape for the next generation. And when young female entrepreneurs like Lakita make space for themselves, they make space for others to be part of the conversation too along uh, the way i have learned to present myself as an entrepreneur first and then as a woman and um, in my field especially like i said women are very very rare i think i've been uh, like mistaken for the mc or like somebody who's lost their way in a conference more times than some somebody who belongs there what i realized uh, later like i think about 2 years ago is that first i used to feel bad i'm like you know i used to get angry i used to be like what the hell like this is not what i want to be you know i need to be taken seriously so i would like be uh, really stern i wouldn't be myself Uh, I would want to like show power and um, present myself in a way that I have to be taken seriously. Then I realized like later that I have to be me and I have to like be myself and comfortable and then people start taking me seriously anyway. And also another thing I've learned is that I'm the most interesting person in the room because everybody is wondering who this girl is. So I I started putting my hand up more. I started like introducing myself more. I would like go and speak to the most important person in the room because I realized even that person wants to know who this girl is because she clearly doesn't look like she belongs here. So I have learned to be comfortable with the fact that I, yes I'm a woman. Yes I'm in agri business. Yes it's unusual. Yes it is a challenge, but well we are here so you might as well make the best of it. Lakita, thank you so much for your insights. I came away uh, absolutely awed by the number of leadership challenges you faced and 
frankly, the brilliance with which you took them on. I think it's a lesson for, there's so many lessons there for all of us. So thank you for being so frank and open and sharing your own leadership challenges during this extremely difficult time. My pleasure. Like with conversation, even with other entrepreneurs, we constantly learn. And hopefully the pandemic has brought about positive change, not only for me, but for like the entire world. So like any change, I think in hindsight, this has always been a good thing. And on that positive note, we've reached the end of today's show. I want to thank Lakita Madakuri for candidly sharing her experiences over the past year. It's been a masterclass in adaptive leadership and crisis management and a timely example of the exciting possibilities for young entrepreneurs in India today. Right, so let me give some closing thoughts here for any leader who is going through a crisis. Okay. First one, remember that you are in a unique position to not only survive, but emerge from the crisis being stronger. And you have the capabilities to do that. The second one that I would say is always think about not just competitive advantage, think also about collaborative advantage. And think about collaborative advantage that comes not from just a transactional approach, comes from a relational approach. And what that means is building meaningful connections that are grounded in trust. Thanks to Lakita Madhukuri for sharing her story and to Professor Baba Shiv for his insights. This has been Grit and Growth, and I'm your host, Darius Teeter. If you want to find out more about leadership and decision-making in crisis, or learn how Stanford Graduate School of Business is partnering with entrepreneurs throughout Africa and South Asia, then head over to the Stanford Seed website at seed.stanford.edu slash podcast. And don't forget to hit follow to hear new episodes. Grit and Growth is a podcast by Stanford Graduate School of Business. Lori Fuller researched and developed content for this episode with additional research by Jeff Prickett. David Rosenzweig is our production coordinator and our executive producer is Tiffany Steves with writing and production from Isabel Pollard and sound design and mixing by Alex Bennett at Lower Street Media. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you.